If you're someone who's passionate about transforming education, which you are if you're listening to this podcast, you should check out the Charles Koch Foundation. The Charles Koch Foundation supports social entrepreneurs and organizations that are embracing innovation to build better solutions for today's learners. Visit ckf.org to learn more. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to Ed Up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. As you guys know, and you've been listening, as shameless plug uh, on my on my part here, because of course uh, I am co-founder of the Ed Up Experience, is that we're writing a book. Uh, you can go to commencementthebook.com, and we're going to take all these insights that we've learned from higher ed professionals, and we're going to put them all in a book, so you don't have to go listen to 300. Well, by the time you listen to this, there might be 400 episodes of the Ed Up Experience. Elvin's keeping me pretty busy these days. Um, I cannot do it alone, so what I've decided to do is bring in guest co-hosts as you guys know at this point i've had lisa hanukkah from fedex and we've had many uh, higher ed professionals that, that have come on um, from institutions all across the country and i have another one with me today here he comes uh yeah, let me let me get him ready here he comes steve forrester he's president at new world university steve what's happening hey joe well you know it's really uh, it's really great to be here you know i've been a, a, a long time uh, appreciator of your podcast and actually being able to be on like this is like it's like I opened up the chocolate bar and there was that golden ticket. Ooh, a golden ticket. I like it. Well, if you're comparing us to Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, then we must be doing something okay too. Um, please play around uh, today, my friend. Uh, you can, uh, you know, just give it to our guest, ask him the hardest questions that you could possibly think of. Don't have any fun, just give him the serious questions because. Um, he, you know, well, we have to turn the tables on this guy a little bit because he's usually one of the guys out there asking the questions, you know what I mean? So we're going to we're going to turn the tables on him just a tad. But first, I'm going to introduce him and I'm going to introduce him in the right way. Here he comes, ladies and gentlemen. His name is Douglas Belkin. He's a reporter of higher education at The Wall Street Journal. Douglas, what's happening? Hey, thanks very much for inviting me on. Uh, did you know, Doug, that you were going to get an applause today? I get an applause every day. My wife stands and applauds as soon as I wake up in the morning. Oh, this is amazing. Uh, that I'm, can you have her call my wife uh, to <laughs> advise her on how to do that? Um, thanks for coming on the Edip Experience, Doug. Why don't you uh, set the stage for us? Uh, besides the obvious, what do you do? Tell us about your experience uh, at the Wall Street Journal um, in, as a reporter covering higher education and just give us the once over. What do you do? How do you do it? Sure. So I've been on this beat for nine years at the Journal, and it's sort of endlessly fascinating. Um, and it's we really cover the, the the sector as an industry, and we cover it kind of soup to nuts from the culture on campus and the different things that are motivating students and faculty to the value of education to the intersection of uh, education and the labor market. Um, it, kind of anything is game. Uh, you know, the Journal's DNA is to follow money and power and influence. So we're particularly interested in those aspects, but um, uh, you know, we, we really write about, about, about anything and everything that uh, that's happening and that we can figure out. Which is why you haven't yet covered the Edip experience because of the whole money, power, and influence uh, thing. We're not hitting any of those. Um, but but, uh, but, but uh, maybe someday we will. Um, talk about, uh, Doug, top of mind besides the obvious COVID trends right now, because I think we're, the Omicron is creating disruption again. What are the top three 2021 trends? I mean, top two, top one, it doesn't matter. Give us the top trends coming out of 2021, moving into 2022 that you could think of off the top of your head. Well, in higher ed, obviously everything pivots off of COVID. Enrollment is, you know, the, really the big questions to be watching. Um, it's it's falling and, 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 uh, it's, and schools are bifurcating if you're strong and powerful, then that continues to be the trend. And if, and if you're weak and suffering, then that, you know, is happening. That's yeah, exacerbating as well. Um, the, uh, so I think, you know, that th th this has been happening a long time before COVID, but it's, it's accelerated it. And so we're following that pretty carefully. The business model of higher education continues to evolve, albeit a little bit slowly. So we, we watch that pretty closely. We look at technology and how that's changing and not changing things. Um, uh, you know, th there's so many moving pieces to the beat from what's happening in admissions uh, to what's happening, uh, you know, with regards to race on campus and, uh, and, and those politics. 
Um, and, and of course, the you know the federal money that's being dispersed uh, will come to an end at some point. And how what happens to the industry at that point? That matters. We're looking at the global aspects of the industry and, and who's coming here and who's not in terms of international. Um, uh, so it, 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 it it's uh, it's hard for me to put my finger on any three particular subjects. I, I think it's closer to thirty that were. Yeah, you know, I think you just rattled off thirty that because there's so <laughs> there and there's so much in that right. There's so much. Yeah depth into into those issues uh, before i pass it over to you steve um uh, doug have you ever seen a crazier time for higher education uh it, it, it's so much to report on is there a, you know is there is there just so much to report on right now and that it, this is a unique time or has it been crazier every year that i've been on this beat the tension and the craziness accelerates it, it, it and, and part of it's probably me just because I'm, I'm get deeper and deeper into it but it, it does seem like every year the stakes seem to grow um and and, and i get you know the, the the evolution of the industry and um gets quickens and so it, it, it's um and then you know i mean COVID has been just nuts so so that's that's exacerbated everything else steve so, so I'm interested in one thing you, um, you, you were referring to the business model of higher education and how it's sort of adapting to, to various things. And I, I assume you mean things like, you know, like changing demographics and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm curious what you think about the sort of flip side of that, that a, a growing number of people, especially in the, in, in the US are, are questioning the overall value proposition of higher education in the first place. And what that means to, I guess, the sector as a whole. Yeah, I mean, that's a central, you know, we've written a lot about this, the idea that, you know, this country sort of doubled down on college for all in the 70s, dropped the kind of trade, European trade model, you know, let's let's prepare kids for the trades and for non-college education, and it's not worked for most kids. I mean, the numbers are pretty stark. Um, 100 kids go to college, 60 graduate in six years, of those 60 um, how many of them end up using their degree? Probably uh, three, maybe half. How many nice. end up with debt? How many end up um, in default? Um, you know, the, the system does not work for most students from an economic standpoint. You can argue from a, you know, a Jeffersonian citizenship, citizenship standpoint, we're adding a lot. And that's, that's, that's a, an argument to be had. But, but financially, it's not, um, uh, it's not a good bet. Uh, for a lot of people, and that's a problem. So uh, that's part of the tension that's in the sector, and part of why I think it's it's moving very quickly. Uh, no, I mean it sounds uh, a lot like like what I've been thinking about, and and also you know he mentioned um, international students, and I did a lot of work with international students at, at at U.S. universities, and and I remember 20 years ago, all of them were doing their very best to try to stay, as soon as their programs were done. And later on, it changed where more and more of them said, oh, no, I'm, I'm going home. I'm going back to China. I'm going back to India. And so I, I just think it's you know, interesting. I mean, not in a very favorable way, but uh, interesting that the sector is facing all of this, uh, all of this trouble from multiple directions simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah, we think we know, you know, we, we think I'm talking about Steve and I and, and most people who's, who are, you know, students of the game, so to speak, in higher ed. And we know, and as you do too, Doug, that Ivy Leagues will be fine. There's a lot of money at the what people consider top tier institutions. And then there's a middle, there's there's institutions from let's just say 1000 to 5000 students, maybe even up to 10,000 students that that with a with a shaky business model might be in trouble. There have been a lot of people predicting closures. Clayton Christensen, you know, said that half of U.S. schools would close and that, you know, within 10 years and it hasn't quite happened yet. But what do you see out there in terms of of, of what closures are going to look like? Is this going to speed up? Are we going to see more closures? Are we going to see more mergers? Is it, are we going to see a slowdown? I think when the federal money, uh, in, that federal injection runs out, then it will quicken. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I, I spoke to uh, Robert Zemsky at, at UPenn about this not too long ago, uh, who knows a lot about it. And, you know, his, his prediction is that it's going to speed up. He said 20% of the schools in the country are um, very vulnerable to closing or to merging. Um, you know, there, some schools are adapting. John Marcus had a nice story the other day in the Heckinger Report about uh, schools trying to adapt, but a lot of them is going to be too little, too late. The the wild card is that the alumni organizations there's a lot of emotional ties that graduates have to their schools, 
and they will step up at the last minute. It may not be a, a good business decision, but it may be a, uh, you know, something they feel with their heart. And, and so um, I think that's been as part of the reason why it's been a lot slower than Christensen and others have predicted. Interesting. And, and I want to, Steve, pass it back to you. But before I do, I'm going to ask you, uh, Doug, which uh, a question that is probably going to be um, the most important question of your life. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, are you ready for it? Yeah, I'm ready. In these episodes, I do like to find out a little bit more about my guest. And since I have a first time guest co-host, Steve, um, you get to ask, you get to answer this question. And then I'm going to ask oh, Doug goodness. the most important one. But you get to think about your answer, Steve, and, and Doug doesn't. So, Steve, you're going to answer for me, what is the dream vacation that you need to take uh, that you haven't taken during COVID? You get to start thinking about that now. But for you, Doug, what's your entrance music? What's that song that plays when you walk in your living room and your wife uh, stands up and claps for you and gives you the applause? What's the one that you would have playing as you step on a stage? What's your entrance music? Oh, man. Um, I guess I'm going to have to go with... Um, uh, I have you know, a Jeopardy thing I can we're, hit. We're, yeah. we're listening to a lot of Beatles. We have a 10-year-old daughter who's learned to play the piano. So, th so there's a lot of um, uh, Imagine... Uh, being played in my house right now. That's probably what, what would come to mind. Amazing. I love that. I love that. Uh, and and uh, Steve, um, well, let's find out about you, my friend. Where are you going? Well, you know, it's 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 funny that you asked me that because, you know, for someone who's, you know, obviously very inter interested in international stuff, I don't actually go to a lot of places. Um, I found out two years ago when all this, this COVID stuff started happening that my normal lifestyle is called quarantine. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> I can definitely tell you there are a number of places south of the Sahara that I haven't been to yet that I, I need to get to. I haven't been to Bamako, Mali. I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to see that. Um, I haven't been to, I haven't been to Nairobi and I, I have friends there who keep telling me that it's, it's amazing and I need to come and see it. So I, I would say that I have sort of a, and, and of course those two cities are, are nowhere near each other. So that's already a sort of a huge trip, but that's, you know, given 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 my choice, then that's what I would do. I would do a do a big tour. So, so for our listeners, you uh, not only do you get to talk about higher ed, but you get educated along the way. We learned a little bit about geography and music uh, here in this episode so far. Steve, back over to you. Okay. Um, so, Doug, um, you um, you mentioned that there you know that institutions that are having a, a hard time. Um, there are some that are that have already failed. What are some that are that are actually getting it right? What are they What are they doing? Who are they? Um, and are they doing stuff that other institutions might be able to emulate to survive? You know, uh, in my line of work, you follow the money, right? So who is growing? Who's growing quickly? And you look at the Western governors and and the Southern New Hampshire's um, that are able to tap into the adult market in a way that most schools have not been able to. Arizona State uh, is doing it. Um, I think meeting people where they are is, is really helpful. I think um, the programs, the line between the academy and the labor market is, is blurring a little bit. I think there was a lot of distance. When I got onto this beat many years ago, I spoke to, I remember Tony Carnavale, and he said, what's happening now is that the pendulum is swinging back. The academy, there's a lot of distance between the academy and the labor market and the academy is taught what the academy has been interested in and not so much what the labor market needs. And so the students, uh, in when times are good, uh, they can take that information and they can sort of learn the job on the job. But when times get tighter, um, uh, that's not so easily done. And the academy has to be more efficient in training students for jobs. And we're seeing that happening. And I think so the schools that are getting it right at this time when things are squeezing are just better aligned with, with the labor market. You look at Northeastern, for instance, they're a pretty good example of a school that's um, you know, thriving right now. And obviously their model is to, uh, is to, is to have a, a work, uh, uh, you know, a co-op so that kids learn and work uh, and, and then learn and work again. Yeah. What, what about smaller institutions that are you know, widely perceived as being especially vulnerable? Right. I mean, a lot of this, a lot of these guys are um, victims of their location. If you're in uh, the Midwest where the demography is going south or in parts of the Northeast, that's a, that's a problem. Um, the schools it seems to me that, you know, the, I think the, the story that stands out in my mind is uh, that, that I did in 2017 looked at the CLA, the critical learning assessment. 
right? If you, what, what are schools purport to do? They try, they, every one of them says somewhere in their mission statement, we are here to teach students to think for themselves, to reach their own conclusions, to synthesize information. But it's hard to determine if they do a good job uh, on that. And, and uh, the, the collegiate learning assessment, as most of your listeners probably know, tries to assess that by giving an exam um, and grading it sort of by the SATs and looking at whether or not kids grow, uh, their ability to think critically grows. Some schools do a good job on that. Some schools do a poor job on that. The, I think the schools, uh, I remember Kalamazoo stood out as a school that was very good at that. Um, so uh, schools that are rigorous, that, that really force kids to think and do the work that haven't lowered their standards, um, I think will continue to have success because they offer something that's valuable. Um, and, and it really doesn't matter what you study. Um, if, if, you, if you learn to think rigorously and, and clearly, then, then that will open doors for you. So like those schools are doing it right. You know, one of the, one of the um, pieces that you wrote that I think is uh, probably one, and I've, I've read a lot of your, your work, but I, I thought it was really impactful is the, the piece in um, September of last year, a generation of American men give up on college. It's just like this growing crazy trend right now. You know, 60% of all college students are female. Uh, what's going on? Why, what's the, what's the, tr the trend besides the fact that American men are not going to college? What? or giving up, why? Why is that happening? And what do you think this impact is gonna look like for you know 20 years from now? Yeah, it's it's so interesting. This phenomenon is so interesting and there's so many variables and there's so many answers to it. And um, so part of it, right, we talked a little bit about the value of the degree. The value of the degree is upside down in a lot of schools. And I think men are more sensitive to debt and to wanting to earn money. And so they're turning away from a bad deal. So that's part of what's happening. Um, uh, but I think the more interesting part is that they are floundering from a very early age in elementary school. They're turned off to school. They're not graduating high school in the same numbers. You know, something like 75% of high school valedictorians are women now. Um, they're just not keeping up with their sisters. And this is particularly um, uh, um, happening in, um, with reading and literacy. And the world is becoming more literate. One of the books I read for that story, looking at it here, um, I read several, uh, Why Boys Fail by uh, Whitmire, a wonderful book. Uh, but he, you know, his thesis is that the world is getting more literate and boys are getting less literate. There's more time on video games. And so as a result, they're, they're, they're floundering in school. And so why, why, do they want to, why do they want more of the same? So they're not enrolling in colleges. And of course, the problem is uh, a lot of jobs need, um, want that credential or the skills that you pick up in college. And so there's going to be uh, a crash. And we're seeing it now, right? I mean, you know, family formation is, is declining. Childbirth is declining. There's a lot of things that are going on around this issue. Obviously, uh, the economy is tough. COVID's a huge issue. But um, the inability of a lot of guys um, to succeed in school and to earn a good living is, I think, part of the mix. Too many learners are being left behind by the current one-size-fits-all model of education. We here at EdUp and our friends at the Charles Koch Foundation see a better path forward. The Charles Koch Foundation supports innovators in education who are building and scaling new pathways to allow all learners to discover their potential. By changing the way we think about education, we can unlock opportunities for millions more Americans. To learn more about the Charles Koch Foundation support of individualized education, visit ckf.org. You know, and you wonder about the long-term impact too. When uh, you know, when you're you're talking about literacy uh, being a challenge for for many men, and then you look at the impact that leads to us with all the other you know, garbage we have going on around us. People don't talk to each other anymore. We can't have a conversation without punching each other in the face. And you know, there just is a, a lack of these human skills. And if your literacy rate is going down, and people are not going to college, my, one of my big worries about college, and and it's perceived value or lack of value in the United States is what that impact looks like from our ability to, to be pe better people. And, you know, I know, I know, I, I believe I, my dissertation was on student consumerism, right? So I believe students are consumers. I believe they buy something and they expect something in return, a, you know, a la Amazon or DoorDash. I mean, higher ed is, it has to operate in that same kind of vein, but in the end, higher ed makes you more well-rounded. You just, people are, don't want to pay a million dollars to get it and be in debt for 30 years. But what's the impact? What's the impact look like if we have just a bunch of people that don't go to college? And what's that going to do to our society, you know? 
I mean, it's me, me on a soapbox just for a minute. What do you think, Doug? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think the, the, the scariest thing is that what that I see happening is that people can't, they can't tell truth from fiction. And uh, so disinformation is pervasive right now. And I think learn to think critically to question where information comes from to follow the logical chain of events to see if something is you know, real or not real, uh, to be skeptical of that information is really critical. And it's becoming more critical in a period where um, information is coming fast and furious. And there's a lot of bad actors who, who want to throw a lot of curveballs. And if we can't get that right as a country, then we're in for some harder times. And it's obviously polarizing us now. So I can't let you can't lay that all on the feet of universities. Um, you know, I think the education system writ large has to take some responsibility and family structure. Um, but that I don't think we've um, evolved as fast as the technology around us has. And that's um, coming home to roost. How do you get before I pass you back, back to you, Steve, I want to ask about you just a second, Doug, because I being a jur- a, a, a reporter or journalist right now, it seems like it's never been harder because there's so much noise, right? There's disinformation, like you talked about fact, fact and fiction, there's different ways that people consume news. Um, anybody could be a reporter, you can go write a blog and you know, and you're, you're not gonna be good, you're not gonna be a good journalist, and you didn't go to school for journalism. What does that do to real journalists? What does that do for, for folks like yourself? Are you finding it harder to get your stuff out there and looked at? And is it harder to be a journalist than it used to be? Well, there's a bunch of things. I mean, you know, to, in some ways, it's it's a knowledge industry like education, and uh, it's it's ahead of the curve in that it was disrupted much earlier than education. Um, so the business model is is not healthy. Um, the, the nationals, like the Journal and the Times and the Post, have have, have done pre- pretty well. But I, you know, I grew up at local newspapers, and I was at the Boston Globe for a long time. Um, those papers are really hurting. So. That's, you know, the, 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 so the business model is a problem. Opportunity is an issue. Uh, the next generation of kids coming up is an issue. Um, who's going to take the place? Who's doing it in, this, in these mainstream jobs? Um, the, uh, the antipathy toward journalists is intense. It was really bad during Trump. I mean, there was, you know, uh, there's a lot of, I have not been told to, to, to screw as many times as I was, you know, over that period of time. Um, and that didn't happen before. I, I did not deal with that kind of contention on a regular basis that I did. And, and I still, still, you still, you know, I've been locked inside more in the last couple of years, but that's, that's a thing. Um, so, um, and then, right, in terms of competing for eyeballs, I feel very fortunate to work at the journal where the standards are high um, the, 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 this, this, this paper, you know, the news pages of the journal really bent over backwards to play it straight um, and, to, and, to, and to try to give facts without bias. And that's our mantra here. There's not that many papers that are doing that and doing it well. A lot of folks have sort of gone and got into bed with one side or the other. Um, so I feel like I'm kind of at an oasis in that um, the, the journal wants to deliver unbiased news. We really careful with facts. A little bit slow sometimes because because we're so careful, but um, uh, the integrity of the brand as a result remains really strong, and so that also opened it's, it's a benefit to me in that it opens some doors. People will take my phone calls. Yeah, you know, I just uh, I, I wanted to bring that up because we all rely so heavily on folks like yourself to give us the information in in our industry in higher education. We don't often talk about what those obstacles and barriers look like for for journalists and reporters who you know inform us on a daily basis. So thanks for giving us your uh, your your experience. And Steve, I'll pass it back to you. Well, sure. And you know, it's funny. I I just kind of want to kind of back that up a little bit because um, I I read a lot of your articles in preparation because I knew that I'd be speaking with you. And over the, especially the last, you know, five to 10 years, I'll be honest, my opinion of especially general interest news media has declined. Um, And it was very refreshing to read article after article where I was learning about what was going on. And, and honestly, couldn't tell what your opinion of it was. Um, And, uh, and I really appreciated that. So, um, so in case anyone's thinking that you're just tooting your own horn, no, it's actually the truth. That, that, that's a, it's, a, it's a real compliment and, and the amount of work um, that it takes, not on, just on my part, but with a lot of editors here who really bust their butt to uh, make the stories, and especially the stories that look at race. You know, we really try to play it down the middle 
um, it's such a contentious issue. So it means a lot to hear that because that is what we're working to do. So it's so, a so good job on that. Yeah. Um, but I did also want to um, go back a little bit and, and, and follow up on one other thing. Uh, you were talking about how academia and industry are, are now moving closer together. And that made me think about um, technical certifications like Google's certs and things like that. Um, and, and it's interesting because a, a, a number of observers are saying things like, these certificates are going to replace higher education. And I'm old enough to remember when people said the same thing about Microsoft certifications in the 90s. And so I was curious whether you think that it's just everything old is new again, and it'll be the same where higher education tends to absorb the innovations that arise to replace it. Or do you think things are different? And maybe the sector is more under threat from these sorts of programs than it might have been in the past. It seems to me that education is more important than ever because technology is changing so quickly and we have to adapt to it. But what will change, or and I'm stealing this from the, the, the Harvard professor who wrote the 60 year curriculum, but it made a lot of sense to me when I read it was that we front loaded education for the past half century. And that um, is not working very well. That there may be, you know, you, you, you get a credential, you go to work, um, you figure out if you like it, if you don't like it, if you want to move in one direction or the other, you go back to school, that these little sort of bite-sized educational credentials and, and, and updating will be much more part of the process um, than they have been. And that, there's opportunity there, obviously, for universities, right? If they become the brand that, uh, and the institution that someone goes back to over the course of their lives, and that can be a great opportunity for them. But that seems like that shift is going to happen um, because it has to, because because things are, are just changing. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, updating your skills is, isn't really a, um, uh, it's it's now mandatory. And I don't know that, that it was two generations ago, one generation ago. Um, so that's the, that's the shift that makes the most sense to me. So sort of like how now there are an increasing number of master's degrees, especially online, that, that don't actually offer or require any uh, any experience in that field in order to, to enroll. No, not so much. Like there's that. Like a master's is a formal expensive credential. And the journal's done a great series this last year looking at some of the, you know, the upside down numbers with, with, with the debt on those master's degrees. But but um, I'm thinking of credentials that are more closely aligned and less traditional. Um, I think that'll be a part, you know, a class, um, a micro credential, uh, I think things like that, as opposed to a big chunk of time where you, you know, um, where you're going, I think they'll, it'll be a little bit smaller and more um, flexible. Um, but, but I'm not a futurist, you know, I'm just looking at the, what's in front of me and trying to project out. Uh, if I can get through the weekend, I'm pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to keep playing. We need to, you have to play that entrance music in your house and then I'll keep you going over through. Yeah, right. What about competition? I mean, you know, because you, you talk to, to schools, you talk to school administrators, you, you're you kind of looking at the landscape. And as much as, as uh, you're, you say you're not a futurist, we're asking you to predict the future. What's a higher ed competition look like? And, and is it just so fierce that you never, you know, have you never seen anything like it? Or is this pretty par for the course just over time? No, it's changed so much in 10 years. I mean, the, the players who were part of the, the competitive landscape now didn't exist, right? I mean, right. So you mentioned Google, um, LinkedIn. Um, I, this, you know, I mean, there are, there are credentials from museums and all sorts of places that, that are popping up now that are um, unbundling the traditional four-year package and that are competitors. Um, and they're doing it, you know, I mean, the, 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 the Keystone example was... Um, uh, the, um, <laughs> I'm showing my age, the, um, code academies, right. They, uh, when they, the when coding they camps. Up, coding boot camps, right. So they, 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 they sort of made a big splash. Um, but that model is being cribbed all over the place. Um, and, uh, and I don't see why that would stop. There's money to be made from entrepreneurs who are selling education in different ways. And, uh, you know, there's, there's enough snake oil salesmen to keep everybody on their toes, but, um, but there's going to be some folks who do a better than the, the traditional universities. They'll eventually absorb it if they're smart and able, uh, but there'll be a lag. That's, that's the, uh, that's, that's as, at least as it's, as it's been. You know, it's interesting that you say that because um, it's truth, right? And you wrote about, uh, you, you, you wrote an article um, about like ITT and, and the debt that was paid back to students from the federal government. And, you know, it's the, the for-profit schools 
used to do all this stuff. And there are just so many less of them. There's just not as many as there used to be. And so, you know, you don't, when you're Google, you could offer a certificate and you don't need to start a school. You are the school, your brand is worth, you, you don't need to do any advertising. You, so all of a sudden you see, you know, the, the second coming, so to speak of what for-profit education may look like. Don't you think? The, the, the regulation, I mean, the, 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 the market will speak, uh, and, but there's a, a lot of people can get burned um, by this as well. Um, it is, it is there's there's a bit of the wild west happening with this stuff there's no two ways about it there's a bit of buyer beware um i always I, to, to interrupt you i to the wild west point is so that is that is very important to talk about because you're na you're naming off you know places you can get a credential and what we see today is and I use this example, it's like your buddy, you know, is offering real estate credentials because he's offering an online class and you could take a credential for something that's, you know, painting and you get some kind of credential. And all of a sudden you just wonder, wait a minute, what has value and what doesn't? And mm -hmm. how do you break through the noise? Right. You know, the, the flip side of that, when I got onto this beat early on, we looked at what the accreditor, you know, the, 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 the guardians of quality in higher education, the watchdogs or the accreditors. And we did a story looking at, at the work that they were doing. And the what, what we found was that there were plenty of schools with graduation rates that were, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent that were still accredited. You know, they still had the imprimatur of the accreditation and could get federal money. So even the schools that are um, um, you know, accredited or getting uh, federal money that are, that are not for profit are can, can be problematic. It is not a, um, uh, and, and I think that's why there's been a flight to quality, right? People are trying to get into brand name schools because uh, they know that A, the brand will serve them well, but also the education is more likely to be stronger. Also because they're less likely to go out of business or, or yeah. not likely at all. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Right. So, you know, if you're going to go to Harvard, you're probably going to be looking back 50 years from now and not probably definitely because Harvard's uh, endowment is more than I think like 50% of the countries uh, in the world. They have more money than uh, than than God himself, I think. Uh, Steve, over to you. <laughs> um, you. You mentioned accreditation and and it, and it's it's funny that you do. It, there's a, a lot of stuff going on with that as well, where the, the regionals are now able to 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 burst forth from their regions and some of the uh the national accreditors are seem to be in trouble asics and, and i think tracks is do you is this part of what's going on with the um with with this just being an, an era of disruption or do you think things are going to settle down with the with the accreditation situation or what do you think about that you know I, i'll be honest with you I, I it's such a niche um and it's such an in the weeds part of the beat that i i have i don't keep up with it that well um, I spent about a year digging into it a few, several years ago, and 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 um, since then I haven't I've not returned to it. I so I can't answer the question with any kind of uh, insider. I, I'm sorry. That's okay. I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, um, boy, you know, the world is changing. Let's just say that, and it's uh, it's uh, it's crazy times. What what's going to happen with uh, what's going to happen with COVID in schools? I mean, is it just going to are we just going to go on like this, Doug? I mean, can you tell me for sure when I'm going to take my mask off, buddy? I'm, I mean, I know you don't have all the answers, but our schools, in even just K through 12, your K through 20, is the is there? I don't know, like fatigue. I mean, is that what we're seeing, or or is COVID going to dissuade people from going to college also because they don't want to put on a mask and go somewhere? I mean, what's what's this impact going to be on higher ed? Tell us the future. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the, the enrollment decline has been significant now. The learning loss is kind of stunning. If you look, the McKinsey put out a report of, in December that looked at, at the, what the learning loss looks like uh, in, in, um, uh, in, in K to 12, and it's, and it's pretty significant. Um, that's going to disrupt the flow of kids into college. Um, so I, I don't know if this if this bounces back in the same way. Um, I you know it's part of the thesis that 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 a lot of these smaller expensive schools will will not make it because the kids are less willing to take a risk of going to school and and maybe are more turned off to school. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, the, the, the long-term impacts of COVID are um, portentous. Is that where you spend a lot of time? Do you, are, you, are you following, you say you follow the money, you follow COVID too, is that push you into stories or is it really as a result of, of the three categories you name, money, power, influence? Yeah, COVID's been a story cow. I mean, I don't think I've written, um, you know, 10% of the stories, at most haven't mentioned COVID in some, in some way, shape or form because it just affects everything. Um, I've covered a, a bunch of the K-12 stuff just because it's been so important right now. And just, you know, whether kids are gonna come back from break and enter, go back to school is, is really critical. Um, and, and the longer I've been on the beat, the more the lines between K-12 to and, and higher ed, um, they begin to sort of blur. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, th this, it does feel like the, the, the bugs are getting, the virus is getting weaker. It's, it still has obviously tremendous impact, but the scales are, are leveling out. I, I hope that this is the last, uh, the last hurrah before this becomes sort of mild-ish and endemic as opposed to chronic. Well, here's yeah. hoping. Yeah. You know, it's, fu it's funny, um, you, you mentioned K-12 and all that. Um, and, and how in the long run this might affect higher ed. I'm curious, I mean, I guess we'll find out in the long run, but whether um, whether online programs at universities will suffer because a whole generation is growing up with remote emergency learning and thinking that that's what distance learning is and won't be interested in even thinking about that for higher education because they falsely believe that it sucks. That's really clever, really insightful point. I hadn't occurred to me. I, yeah. Um, um, I mean, right. The high school kids, they want to be social. They want to connect. The college kids want to be social. They want to connect. But but it's hard to bet against technology. I mean, every time you think <laughs> you've seen the best of something, it gets a little bit better. I mean, what are they have hologram teachers like that? That's going to be in classrooms. If I think it's already there. Um, the experience is going to continue to 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 get better. But ultimately, people want to be with other people. Right. We're monkeys on trees now we're wearing ties but it's the, the same impulse we want to be around each other so uh, I think it, it, it's an addendum it won't be uh, um, it, 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 not, not for everybody there's still going to be a rite of passage where people want to congregate and have that sort of uh, um, experience where they sort of end their adolescence and enter adulthood in a cohort although it's become kind of a luxury brand but that that, that I think that demand isn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, Doug, we like to ask the each guest uh, the same two questions to end out our episodes. And this, Steve, you have any other questions you want to fire away at? Uh, no, I, everything's been just so interesting, but thank you. Yeah, yeah, we could do this forever, Doug, and I'm sure you don't want to. So we'll <laughs> close out the episode. Uh, number one, Doug, what did we not say about uh, the Wall Street Journal? Uh, what did we not ask you? Anything you want to say, plug? Um, coming up, events you're going to, anything at all, so plug away. And then obviously, um, uh, secondarily to that, and you talked about it a little bit, what's the future of higher ed look like? Well, I, you know, in terms of the journal, I, it's a really strong um, newspaper with a lot of smart, hardworking people pushing hard to get the truth out and to do it in an unbiased way. I think, um, you know, for my money, the people who are the most interesting to speak with read a broad range of, of, of current events. They don't just read from one sort of bucket. Um, they, they, read, they read broadly. I, I, I really can't recommend the journal high enough. Um, in terms of the future of higher ed, uh, the, the, the evolution of our species is where it's more and more complicated. We have to know more things to, to survive well. Um, so in, in some way, shape or form, Higher education will uh, will grow. Uh, I I don't know what what form it'll take. Uh, Harvard will still be around, but there's probably a lot of places that don't yet exist that are important in uh, uh, you know in a decade from now. I love it. Well, that, there you have it, guys. Uh, Doug, you said it all. I encourage obviously everybody to hit you can do a Google search, put in Douglas Belkin at WSJ, and then you will get his uh, landing page that lists all his articles. Uh, incredible work. You've probably come across this stuff before. I know I have in many, many examples. Uh, but before I exit Doug from this podcast, I do want to thank my uh, guest co-host today. Here he is again, ladies and gentlemen. Steve Forrester, President of New World University. Steve, thanks for coming on. How'd you enjoy your co-hosting experience today? Oh my God, Joe, it was a blast. I'm so glad that I was able to be here. 
I'm glad to have you and hopefully we'll see you again, my friend. And of course, um, Doug, uh, it, it was an honor to, to host you and ask you these questions and, and hopefully uh, you being on the receiving end of all the questions gave you the nice experience, a flip experience, if you will. Very bizarre. Feels very bizarre to be in the other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we like to do bizarre here at the Edip Experience. So here he is, ladies and gentlemen. My guest today, Doug Belkin. He's a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, look him up, follow him. You need to because he writes amazing stuff. And uh, I would I would use a different four letter word for for your amazing stuff um, if I could. But then I'd have to hit the explicit button on this episode, which I don't want to do. Um, Doug, thanks for coming on today. Thanks so much, guys, for for having me. It's been a fun, a fun conversation. I appreciate the uh, the time. All right, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed up. The purpose of education is to help learners discover their aptitudes and interests, develop their skills, and then deploy that knowledge to benefit themselves and others. The Charles Koch Foundation, a nonprofit grant making organization, works with leaders in education to remove barriers that stand in the way of all learners reaching their potential. They support individualized and flexible models that improve access and quality for millions of Americans. They also support apprenticeship and upskilling programs that connect learners to in-demand jobs that match their skills and interests. The foundation is looking for new partners to challenge the status quo and transform the post-secondary education system. Learn more about their partnership opportunities and apply for a grant at ckf.org. You can also find them on Twitter at at Foundation and LinkedIn by searching Charles Koch Foundation.